In the golden age of chrome and corner stores, flying was for the wealthy until one aluminum underdog rolled onto the runway and changed everything. While today's glass cockpit marvels are crippled by complexity, this so-called relic proved its worth with a feat modern aircraft have never matched, 64 days in the air, non-stop. How did a simple, gravity-fed machine from the 1950s leave today's technology in the hangar? The answer begins with a crisis few remember and ends with a legend still flying. In the years after the war, the dream of flight hung just out of reach for most Americans. On paper, the skies were open. In reality, the price tag locked the hangar door. The price was real. A brand new airplane in the early 1950s cost more than a house in most towns. Even the so-called affordable models, like the Piper Cub, ran north of $3,000, at a time when the average worker took home less than $60 a week. That cost kept pilots grounded. The returning GIS, men who had dodged flak over Europe and islands in the Pacific, found themselves grounded by simple math. Veterans filled the airfields, hungry to keep flying, but the cost of a cockpit was a wall few could climb. The market was flooded with war surplus trainers, but those machines were maintenance hogs, thirsty for parts and gas. For the working man, flying remained a rich man's hobby. The flight schools, the clubs, even the weekend flyers, most were bankrolled by doctors, lawyers, or the lucky few who had done well in the post-war boom. Pilots who learned on government time now watched from the fence as their skills faded. The country was full of would-be aviators, but the runways stayed quiet. The promise of flight for everyone was just that, a promise, not a reality. Something had to give. The country needed a machine that didn't require a mortgage or a mechanic with a briefcase full of specialty tools. Until then, the sky was for the few, not the many. In 1956, a new shape rolled out of Wichita, Kansas, a machine that did not look like a sports car or a warbird, but a tool. The Cessna 172 arrived with its high wing, tricycle gear, and a promise stamped right on the brochure, land o -matic. No more tail dragger ground loops, no more white knuckle landings. Here was an airplane that did not punish you for being human. It was a flying pickup truck built for the everyman, not the country club. Cessna's engineers did not chase speed records or follow fads. They built something you could trust. The 172's debut was not about flash or bragging rights, it was about opening the sky to anyone who could scrape together a down payment. For the first time, a family could walk onto a ramp and see themselves in the cockpit. Flight schools lined up, weekend pilots lined up. The waiting list stretched out the door. They called it the Landomatic because it forgave mistakes. It soaked up hard landings, shrugged off crosswinds, and kept flying when others would have been in the shop. The secret was not magic or marketing, it was honest engineering. The 172 did not ask much from its owner. Change the oil, check the tires, drain the fuel sumps, and it would do its part, day after day. The sky, once reserved for the privileged, was suddenly wide open. The 172 became the trusted partner for anyone with the will to fly. It was not just an airplane, it was a handshake deal between Cessna and the American dream. The Cessna 172 does not ask gravity to work overtime. It simply lets gravity do its job. Fuel tanks ride high in the wings, perched above the engine like water towers on a prairie skyline. There is no electric pump humming, no backup system waiting to fail. When you open the throttle, gravity pulls fuel down from those wing tanks straight into the carburetor every time. If the engine is running, you know the fuel is flowing. It is a system so basic that a mechanic with a flashlight and a screwdriver can trace every inch of it. No tangled wires, no hidden relays. If something goes wrong, you do not need a computer diagnostic, you need a rag and a wrench. That high wing is not just for looks. It is an engineer's handshake with physics. The struts carry the load directly into the fuselage, spreading the stress out like a barn roof braced for a blizzard. The whole airplane is built to shrug off punishment. Land hard, hit a pothole, catch a gust, the wing stays put, the fuel keeps flowing, and the pilot keeps flying. Center of gravity matters too. With the wings up top and the cabin slung beneath, the 172 rides steady, like a hay wagon on a country road. You can load it nose heavy or tail heavy, but the wing's position helps keep the balance honest. That is why students trust it, 
and instructors trust it even more. The airplane forgives because the design never tries to outsmart the laws of nature. Every time a modern plane grounds itself with a blinking warning light, the 172 keeps running on the oldest force in the book. Gravity does not take a day off. As long as the tanks are full and the wing is above your head, you are in business. That is the kind of logic you can count on, simple, stubborn, and proven. The sky is not a place for clever tricks. It is a place for things that work. Under the cowling, the Cessna 172 keeps things honest. The engine, whether continental or Lycoming, delivers 160 to 180 horsepower, just enough to haul four people and a load of groceries, but not a drop more than needed. It is air-cooled, horizontally opposed, and built on the same logic that keeps tractors running through three generations. There is no turbo, no computer brain, no secret source. You want to swap a spark plug, pull over, pop the cowling, and do it with the same wrench you would use on a lawnmower. Mechanics do not need a laptop. They need a rag and a set of sockets. Every part speaks the same language. Magnetos, oil filters, plugs, all off the shelf, not locked behind a proprietary label. If the engine coughs, you can see the problem, touch it, and fix it. No waiting for a factory tech to fly in from out of state. No shipping parts across oceans. The Cessna 172's heart keeps beating because it was built to be understood, not just admired. Look at the skin. Aluminum, riveted by hand in Kansas, patched by hand in a thousand hangers since. If a storm throws a branch through the wing, you do not call the insurance company and wait for a composite specialist. You grab a sheet of aluminum, a drill, and a box of rivets. Half an hour later, you are flying again. There are 13,000 rivets holding the Cessna 172 together, and everyone is a promise. This plane was made to take a beating and come back for more. That is why you still find them working in the bush, in the desert, on grass strips and gravel bars. The Cessna. 172 does not care if the runway is paved or the hangar is a barn. Field repairs are not a backup plan. They are the plan. The engine forgives rough hands. The skin forgives hard landings. When the job is done, the mechanic wipes off the oil, closes the cowling, and the old bird is ready for another day. That is reliability. You can feel in your bones. Robert Tim was a slot machine mechanic with a stubborn streak and a gambler's nerve. John Cook Hackathol, a young pilot with a clean record and a steady hand, joined him as co-pilot. They were not famous aviators or daredevils. They were working men, chasing a record most thought was impossible, 64 days in the air, circling the empty spaces between Las Vegas and Blythe. On the morning of December 4th, 1958, the record clock started ticking. The rules were simple. Never touch the ground. Never cheat the clock. The world would be watching, and the white paint on their tires would prove every minute spent in the sky. The plan was as much about survival as it was about flying. The Mojave and Sonoran deserts offered wide open air and steady weather, fewer mountains to dodge, fewer storms to roll in unannounced. Day after day, Tim and Hackathal traced lazy loops over the same sun-baked roads, the same dry washes and railroad spurs. The desert was their arena, and it was their prison. Nowhere to land, nowhere to hide from the sun, the wind, or the endless engine noise. Inside the cockpit, the line between man and machine began to blur. Sleep came in short bursts, stolen between fuel checks and radio calls. Every hour brought a new ache, shoulders locked from holding the yoke, eyes burning from the glare off the sand. Tim's hands grew raw from gripping the controls. Hackathol's voice, calm at first, turned hoarse and clipped as the days stacked up. The logbook filled with tiny scrawls, fuel readings, oil checks, time checks. Each mark a promise to keep going. The desert offered predictability, but not mercy. Daytime heat crept through the glass, baking the cabin. At night, the temperature dropped so fast, their breath fogged the windows. The wind could turn rough in an instant, tossing the little Cessna like a tin can. But the high wing and simple bones of the Cessna 172 took the punishment. The pilots trusted the machine, and the machine kept flying. Every 12 hours, the real danger arrived, a rolling truck on the highway below loaded with fuel and supplies. The next minutes would test the nerves of both men and the limits of their aircraft. 
Refueling from a moving truck meant split-second timing, razor-thin focus, and the constant risk that one mistake would end the attempt. Until those minutes came, it was just Tim and Hackathol, the desert, and the relentless tick of the record clock. They kept circling, minute by minute, hour by hour, driven by grit, duty, and the stubborn belief that a simple airplane could outlast anything the modern world could throw at it. The truck rolled down Highway 95, engine straining, speedometer needle steady at 55. Above, the Cessna 172 matched its pace, wheels barely clearing scrub and telephone wires. Every refuel was a dance with disaster, no margin for error, no second chances. The ground crew, one hand on the wheel, the other white-knuckled on the throttle, kept the truck straight as desert wind threatened to shove it off the blacktop. In the bed, a fuel drum and pump waited, hose coiled like a snake, ready to strike. Grit. As the plane dropped lower, the pilot eased open the side window. The crew below stood up in the moving truck and timed their throw. The hose arced up, caught by the slipstream, and the co-pilot leaned out, catching it on the first try. No helmets, no harnesses, just grit and trust in each other's hands. The hose locked into the wing tank port, and the pump roared to life, fuel surging up, gravity doing the rest. The Cessna 172's high wing and gravity-fed system meant fuel flowed as soon as the hose was secure, no waiting, no priming, no electrical relay to fail. The pilot watched the gauge, eyes flicking from the road below to the needle as it crept upward. Gravity. Every second, the tires skimmed inches above the highway. One wrong move and the record attempt would end in a shower of aluminum and sparks. The white paint on the wheels, applied before takeoff, remained untouched, proof that the plane had never cheated the ground. FAA officials would check for scuffs after landing, but for now, the only thing between the pilots and disaster was the steadiness of the truck, the strength of the hose, and the relentless pull of gravity. Once the tanks were topped off, the co-pilot released the hose, letting it drop back to the truck. The plane climbed away, engine droning, the logbook marked with another successful refuel. They performed this ballet 128 times, never landing, never stopping. Each pass was a gamble, each connection a handshake between man, machine, and the laws of physics. The Cessna 172's design did not just allow this, it made it possible. Simplicity meant reliability, and reliability meant survival. In the quiet after the truck faded into the distance, the pilots settled back into their endless circuit, knowing they had cheated gravity for another half day. Modern airplanes promise the world with their digital cockpits and composite skins, but ask any mechanic what keeps them up at night and you will hear the same story. Fragility hiding behind the glass. A Cirrus or Diamond parked in the hangar can be grounded for weeks waiting on a proprietary screen or circuit board. When a glass panel goes dark, there is no workaround. The FAA's records show a growing list of incidents where a blank display forced pilots to land, sometimes with nothing but a backup iPad to guide them. It is not just a nuisance, it is a grounding event. The average wait for a replacement avionics part stretches four to eight weeks, and that is if the factory even has it in stock. Underneath that sleek shell, the wiring harness is a spiderweb of sensors and relays. One bad ground or a fried chip, and the whole airplane is out of commission. Structural repairs are no easier. A bird strike or a hailstorm can mean a month waiting for a composite specialist to patch the skin. No field fix, no rivets, no quick turnaround. Mechanics who cut their teeth on the old 172s shake their heads. They remember when a fuel gauge failure meant a soldering iron and an hour, not a call to avionics support, and a four-figure invoice. Reliability is more than a spec sheet. It is the difference between flying today and waiting for a part number to clear customs. Walk onto any flight school ramp and you will find the same story, told in oil-stained logbooks and worn seat cushions. The Cessna. 172 is the backbone of pilot training, the machine that welcomes first flights and final check rides. Instructors have passed the keys from hand to hand, generation after generation, because the numbers just add up. A new glass cockpit trainer can cost $400,000 or more, sometimes north of $600,000. 
For that price, you get touchscreens, software updates, and a maintenance bill that can ground a student's dreams before they ever leave the pattern. But a used one, 7-2, bought for a fraction of that, keeps flying. It keeps teaching. That is why more than half a million pilots worldwide have learned to trust its steady wing. The secret is not just in the metal or the price tag, it is in the way the fuel flows, a gravity feed, honest and patient, doing its work year after year. No computer to fail, no pump to burn out. The same force that pulls a wrench into a child's hand is the one that keeps this airplane alive. That is the promise. As long as gravity works, so will the Cessna 172. The sky stays open, not just for the few, but for anyone willing to learn. And every time a new pilot climbs in, the legacy continues, simple, strong, and built to last. Even now, over 44,000 of these machines still fly, more than any other aircraft model in history. In an age where software glitches can ground fleets overnight, simplicity remains undefeated. The lesson isn't in nostalgia, it is in resilience. When the screens go dark, the old aluminum still finds its way home. Some things outlast innovation because they're built for what matters most. Share your stories of the classics below.